Hello and welcome to episode 46 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco. And thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast. If this is the first episode you're listening to at the Page One Podcast, we like to speak to writers of all kinds, uh, authors, screenwriters, video game writers, comic book writers, about the writing process, how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. We've had some great guests recently, people like Lauren Bukis, Alistair Campbell, and last week Ian Dunt. Um, whose publisher actually enjoyed the episode so much that they've offered a 10% discount to podcast listeners uh, on Ian's book, which is definitely worth picking up. Um, It's on uh, the Canberra Publishing website. We retweeted their offer. I think it's a 10% discount if you enter the code RIGHTGEAR at checkout and you get a signed first edition of that book. So I'd highly recommend you take advantage of that offer. But we've got another great guest this week, don't we, Tarek? This week, we do have a great guest. We are chatting with Mr. Dirk Maggs, who is a, I think we described him last week as a superstar of the audio movie world. Which yeah, is I think that's is quite a fair way yeah. of describing him, I think. And what is an audio movie, Tarek? An audio movie is kind of like a radio drama, I suppose, where he's he's adapted a lot of uh, novels. But, but much bigger than the radio drama, though. Much bigger than radio drama, because it's got incredible voice casts from famous actors, it's got special effects, it's got music. And it's kind of like a play in which he's adapted comics and books. Uh, and r- rather than just being a simple audible or audio book where someone reads the book to you, it's kind of, it's being acted out and it's mm-hmm. it's full voice cast, proper production values. And you've probably heard things like the Alien books he's done, the X-Files books he's done. Um, Never Aware by Neil Gaiman. He's done quite a Never lot of collaboration with Neil Gaiman. And of course, most recently... Absolutely, the He'd, Sandman. Yeah, which is, of course, uh, this epic Neil Gaiman comic. I mean, most people will have heard of it, but it's an epic series of comics, graphic novels by Neil Gaiman that people have said were unfilmable. Mm-hmm. And um, Dirk took that as a challenge, I think, to, to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to say, well, it's not filmable, but we can turn it into an audio movie. Um, but And actually, it's also been turned into a TV show for Netflix as well, as, as it happens. But the, the audio movie the, the, that's available on um, Audible is absolutely amazing. Highly recommend yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a really deep dive uh, with Dirk into how he has crafted what I think is quite a unique career but you know there's a lot of writing there which is why we wanted to speak to him because he actually writes these things even if he's adapting this work he writes it he um, takes that material and adapts it himself so we learn in great detail about how he started at the BBC as a producer and then effectively came up with this idea himself and developed it himself yeah Yeah, yeah. this this whole path it's a great example of someone who's kind of forged a complete niche mm-hmm. in, especially back then back in the 70s 80s this time where there was nothing like this at it's all it's not that old Tarek how old is it? I thought it was, I thought it was oh, sorry sorry Derek hopefully it's <laughs> back in the 90s uh, I think it was yeah and, and he's and he's kind of created this entire industry really from the ground up and and and, and I, yeah it, it's an incredible body of work he's done and it's a very interesting Mm-hmm. A journey of how he's got there. It is so. Um, the, what I would say is the podcast is sort of divided into two halves. Where uh, you you hear we ask Dirk a question at the start, and for the next forty five minutes he tells us about how he <laughs> he went through that career at the BBC. It's really really interesting, and he's a brilliant storyteller. Um, he's got great anecdotes, uh, and he's met so many incredible people. And he tells us about the writing journey as well. So it's definitely worth listening to. And then we get into the more um modern stuff with the Sandman and stuff from about 50 minutes onwards um, we, we chat to him about that but it's, the whole thing is definitely worth listening to so I'd recommend you do Yeah, he's a super nice guy and it was a really fun chat we had with him. It was, so we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat to let you know about next week's guest But on with the podcast The blank page To some it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome but we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? 
What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Yours, I think, of all the guests that we've had on, yours is the most unique, I think, in terms of, of jobs. How how was it that you've you've found yourself in this world of uh, creating audio dramas? What was the path? It was a weird path for me because I originally wanted to be a filmmaker. When I was at school, my dad uh, had an 8 mil cine camera and when I was about 15, 16, we were just a bunch of really inventive kids. I mean, nothing, nothing particularly special about us. We just, and Monty Python was happening and so on. And so we, and my dad had this camera. So we went out and made these silly films together. And um, we did, uh, we did the Patrick Moore story because we all watched <laughs> Patrick on the sky at night. And um Nothing to do with the fact that much later on I actually became good friends with Patrick and, and he was, a, you know, a dear old bloke in his sort of duffery way. But, um, uh, yeah, we made these silly sort of bi biopic of uh, Patrick in uh, 1971. I mean, seriously, I'm very old now, so this is going back to the Ark um, or Gilgamesh or whatever. Um, anyway, so yeah, so we did, uh, so we did this film, and then we did this Viking epic, sort of encouraged by the um, Monty Python historical romps they did in Python. You know, oh, if they can do it, we can do it. So this Viking romp, and had um, sort of the same, the same twenty Vikings playing the same twenty Celts fighting each other in a battle. So you know, it was this sort of fun with a camera, mm -hmm. and of course, in those days, syncing the sound was an absolute bugger it was mm -hmm. really hard to do because nothing was digital nothing was nothing interlocked yeah. so you know trying to put a soundtrack to that was quite challenging and fun but every time we played them back we had a very speed on the projector and a very speed on the tape machine so that we could sort of wander the sink <laughs> in and out of each other we did a narration rather than lip sync but that was kind of the that was kind of the thing so I kind of wanted to get into filmmaking and this was the early 70s come the mid 70s and I didn't know how to go about it because the mechanisms weren't really there. It was closed shop mm -hmm. in those days, unionized and so on. So I thought, <clears throat> well, I'll go to um, I'll go to a college, but I'll, I'll because I'm not sure what I want to do. I also was drumming in bands, so there was this incredible kind of too many interests and not mm -hmm. enough focus on what I wanted to do. So I trained to be a teacher and I trained to be a drama teacher. I thought, well, maybe I could even act anything that would make a bit of money when I was out of work because I anticipated lengthy lengthy <laughs> periods of unemployment. <laughs> Um, and as it happened, I, I spent four years to get the degree. You had to do four years at teacher training college in Winchester um, and had a fantastic time. Um, but at the end of it, somebody said, um, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. I, 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 I don't want to teach. I'm a lousy teacher. I'm no good at class control. I, I don't mind if they do what they want. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm really and also I'm not a terrible 
terribly good actor. I realised that the day that we did the importance of being earnest, and I was wearing one of those top hats for a funeral with the crepe hanging down the back, and it's my <laughs> final entrance on the final night with a flourish, put it on backwards, and walked out <laughs> with a sort of pair of black crepe curtains in front of my face. So I, I kind of knew that I had to think quickly. And there was a girl from the year above me who gone off and done who knows what and we were doing a we had a college band and we were doing our farewell valedictory gig and she came back to visit and I said what are you doing now she said I'm with the BBC I'm working as a studio manager in radio and I said well what's that and she said oh you know you operate tape machines in the studio and if you've been there for a while then you can um uh, operate the desk and do the sound and uh, and I thought I can do that I like you know I've played with tape recorders and I love audio I love things like the mm. Goon Show and all those old when I was a kid in the 60s there was round the horn every lunchtime on a Sunday so you know all the radio comedy that was in my in my heritage came out and anyway long story short I applied and I got the job just to the astonishment of my careers um, tutor in college you thought the BBC was a you know closed shop, mm -hmm. so I joined BBC Radio and um, and as soon as I went in, I told everybody I'm going to television, I'm going into film. That's what I'm going to do. Well, um, about a year in, once I passed my test and met my future wife over a hot tape machine and uh, various other things, <laughs> um, I managed to get a secondment to BBC Television in 1980, and I was there for about a year, eighteen months, doing all sorts of things. Uh, but mainly doing associate uh, assistant producer in presentation, which was making trailers and um, and op and, and net directing the network, stitching the network to re together every night. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a very interesting job. It wasn't particularly creative, but it taught me about television. And the one thing it really taught me about television was that I utterly hated it, and I thought it was tedious and boring, and very much it was it was like. The engineers all wandered around in cardigans and slippers smoking pipes. It felt like they just wandered out their living room to get a cup of tea. It didn't have the sort of vibrance. Not how you imagine it at all, really, is it? Not in the least. And I was thinking, you know, I want, I want excitement. I want adventure. Yeah. I want ha-cha-cha, you know. <laughs> and it wasn't that. So I went back to radio and I was, you know, I had plenty to do. I was playing in bands and, you know, I was getting married to Les and all of that. And we were buying a house and all of that. So... I kind of carried on, but um, I had to do something. And eventually, via security means, I got into Radio 2 making trailers because I had, I had experience making trailers. And, um, I mean, I'll trust you edit this down. If you, if yeah, you yeah don't on. worry. No, 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 <laughs> don't worry, but this is good. Uh, I was making trailers, and that was a good education, making trailers, because we had to make five, five or six trailers a day, and they were the regular ones where you got Ken Bruce saying, well, hello, everybody, and, you know, on the show this morning, our special guest is, you know, mm -hmm. Jackie Stewart or something like that, you know, great, okay. And then, you know, so you just put a bit of Ken's signature tune up there. But then you'd also get two or three trailers which were for special events, and some of them would be um, like a TV license fee. And so I saved those up for the <laughs> afternoon because we had a little studio next to our sort of office in Broadcasting House where we had one technician, we had two tape decks, two, re uh, two gramophone decks, vinyl, and, and wonder of wonders in 1988, we actually managed to get um, a CD player, which was about the size of a fridge. Um, and, uh, and, we, uh, and we were making these trailers. And in the afternoon, I saved up these sort of fun ones where we could be inventive. Mm -hmm. And um, so, for example, if we did uh, TV license fee gift tokens, um, we would uh, make... Um, the one minute Lord of the Rings, you know, the Lord <laughs> of the Rings, he has everything but a TV license. <laughs> um, and so, so there were me and Steve Madden and Charles Nove and all these David Bellin and all these uh, Patrick Lunt, all these Radio 2 announcers, who of course welcomed the chance to not be uh, announcers for yeah. half an hour, came in and made all these silly trailers. So we had enormous fun. And we ended up with a, with a, um, we had a sort of, it was called Crime Check and it was sort of a neighborhood watch thing. Um, and we had to trail this idea and they were going to do a week of Radio 2 of how to look after your house and everyone else's. And, uh, and I, uh, we were trying to think how to trail it. I said, I know we should have famous detectives. We should have Miss Marple and Hercule Poirot and Sherlock Holmes and Watson and, um, 
And who are the detectives? Oh, Batman. There's a detective. He's a detective. Let's get him. You know, I had this list of people, and most of the clearances were easy because it was like, you know, you can do a Sherlock Holmes spoof. Yeah. But I thought, Batman, maybe I should ring DC Comics in New York and talk about Batman. So I rang DC Comics in New York, which was like ringing the moon or yeah. Mars or yeah. something. It was in the 80s. You know, it was such a thing you didn't do, even from the BBC. In New York, and this lady called Phyllis answered, and she said, um, she I, she was in international affair, a business affairs, and she said, uh, I, I said, you know, can we use Batman in this thing? Expecting a no, and she said, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> we ought to hear, we ought to hear it though. And I said, well, uh, do you want me to send it to you? Because in those days, we didn't have the internet, mm -hmm. so like I'd have to send them a tape. Uh, and she said. Um, uh, no, uh, somebody's coming over to uh, Bologna Book Fair. They're coming via London, so they can come and listen next week. So, <laughs> we, so we did the trailer, and this this lady came in, Chantal Dornis, who's uh, I think I think is well, it's French name, but I think she might have been Belgian. She lives in Holland now. Lovely lady. She came in, listened to it, and she said, um, "Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Let's go." Yes, and she said. Um, you should you should do more stuff like that, and and the, I should add the Batman that we did was really kind of like sub Adam West <laughs> stuff. Okay, <laughs> it's me and Steve Madden doing Adam West and Burt Ward really badly. <laughs> Steve Brilliant. is I'm being Robin. I'm being Robin. Meanwhile, in a hidden cave deep underneath the mansion on the outskirts of Gotham City... Holy frustration, Batman! Until the new crime computer's ready, how can we keep tab on the rising crime rate? That's the last circuit in place, Robin. Now to switch on for a complete picture of crime statistics worldwide. Holy global crisis! And we've got our hands full with Gotham City. If only people knew how to protect themselves. Wait, let's ask the computer. You're thinking, Batman. What does it say? It seems we have an ally in our fight. You mean Superman? Wonder Woman? No, the BBC. All next week, they're running a campaign on Radio 2 called Crime Check, advising people on how they can avoid becoming victims of crime and how victims can help themselves. Could this be the end of the dynamic duo? Is this where we hang up our utility belts? I doubt it, Robin, but let's hope people tune into Radio 2 next week for Crime Check. It's the bat signal! To the Batmobile, Robin! If only we had Crime Check here in Gotham City. Crime Check! <laughs> anyway, so we did this thing and Chantal said, do it. And she said, you know, that's not bad. Uh, so I'm thinking, oh my God, that's not bad. And she said, um, do you know it's Superman's 50th birthday next year? You should do something about that. And I'm just like storing this away thinking, yeah, yeah, hang on a minute. There's a reason I could use that. And, you know, we, yeah. we parted and she was lovely. And the thing was, I was applying to be in BBC Radio Light Entertainment, which was the comedy department. I, and my, all my writing was just trails at that point. Mm -hmm. I was just writing, you know, sort of three sentences and that was 30 seconds. Um, but they wanted, if I was going to get this job in Light Entertainment, they needed three program ideas. And so I came up with... Uh, the Superman's uh, 50th birthday, some kind of dramatized documentary. I didn't think much beyond that. And I also put in a quiz, an idea for a quiz show involving announcers, you know, do what you know. And mm -hmm. I'm working with announcers all the time. And I can't remember what the third one is. Anyway, I got the job at BBC Radio Comedy Department, which, of course, 10 years earlier was where... Douglas and Jeffrey Perkins and Simon Brett had made Hitchhikers. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, and, and from whence came The Goon Show back in the day mm -hmm. and Round the Horn and Radioactive and I'm sorry, I'll read that again and all of these iconic shows and somewhere I, I'd wanted to work. Um, so I was in this sort of, you know, milieu, this culture of not only producing but writing, even though officially as a producer I wasn't supposed to write stuff. Mm -hmm the corridor was full of writers who did and we had um, a writer's room at the end and every week um, there were two uh, there were two topical comedy shows one was the uh, week ending for BBC Radio 4 which was no audience very sort of quite hard satire um, uh, sort of stuff and the other was the news hub lines which was an audience show which I was quite well acquainted with because I used to make trailers for them for Radio 2 so I'd been down to the Paris studio in Lower Regent Street where the audience studio was and um, I'd spent some time down there and seen Roy Hudd and June Whitfield and Chris Emmett working 
And of the two, I, I kind of, I, I, I didn't really respect news headlines because I thought well, it was end of the pier and it was kind of carry on humor and it wasn't quite my thing. Mm-hmm. Weekending was a bit clever and a bit sort of John Lloyd, um, not the nine o'clock news sort of. In fact, John Lloyd, I think John invented both weekending and the headlines, which is what kind of a genius he is. Um, so there was all this going on and we had a writer's room at the end of the corridor and it was full of writers and it was frankly quite intimidating to be in there. I mean, you'd walk up the corridor and there's Stephen Fry coming one way and there's future stars or what you didn't know them, but walking the other way are David Baddiel and Rob Newman and, you know, all of this. It was a pretty impressive bunch of people. And if I say that one of my fellow producers of my generation was Amando Iannucci, you know, we were (laughs) there at the same time, you know, so... It was a pretty rich place in terms yeah. of talent and fairly daunting. Um, and I got stuck in and I started making programs and we made the Superman docu-drama and I had the sudden brainwave. There was a show on TV at the time, an American sort of soapy thing called L.A. Law, mm-hmm. one of the Stephen Bochco things. And um, so a trial situation. I said, oh, Superman on trial. That way we can have evidence for the defense and the prosecution. Oh, wouldn't it be great if Lois Lane was defending him and Lex Luthor was prosecuting him and the judge was an alien from another planet and Superman was charged with crimes against humanity. And it's sort of the the whole thing bubbled up, you know, when you have a really great idea and you just got to get it down. And then, of course, using dramatized sections of comic books as evidence for either in support of or against Superman. And we also had, um, we had uh, mythical characters uh, for the uh, prosecution and the defense. Um, we, had, uh, we had Dave Gibbons, the artist from Watchmen, of course, who was, you know, still very, is still hot now, but I mean, was very hot then because of Watchmen. Yeah. And Dave came in and, and, and turned out to be a thoroughly lovely bloke. Um, Jeanette Kahn, who was the president and publisher yeah. of DC Comics at the time, she came in and gave evidence. But then we had some really cool stuff like because I'm working at Broadcasting House and literally at Broadcasting House, you know, you walk in the front door and I, I, I do remember one day I walked in the front door of Broadcasting House and coming out of one door was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Coming out of the lift was Richard Johnson and a big Royal Shakespeare Company actor. And coming up the stairs from the basement studios is Frank Zappa. <laughs> and you think only at Broadcasting House can can that kind of happen. Yeah. You know? And you Anyway, my, my last meeting at Bro- with uh, Douglas Adams was in the foyer at Broadcasting House because mm. that's where everybody, you know, yeah. that's where mm-hmm. the world came. Um, <clears throat> but I was, I was doing this, walking into Broadcasting House, and, and coming the other way was Adam West as we're making this program. And I'm thinking, <laughs> shoot, I've got to get this guy. So, you know, and he's got a couple of minders with him, but they don't look too unpleasant. So I went up and said, Mr. West, big and more of your work. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I can't do the voice, but that's the voice. <laughs> what a voice. And I said... Um, I can see you're here, and he was there for, they were rerunning the TV show, mm-hmm. Batman TV show again, yet again. And I said, I know you're here to uh, to do other stuff. This is, you know, very much off the cuff, but would you consider being a, being a witness in the trial of Superman? In the trial of Superman, that sounds very interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think we can make a little time. Meet me here in uh, half an hour. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, mate, um, and I went back. This is, you know, never, never miss an opportunity. Yeah. Is the moral <laughs> of this story. And blow me down. Half an hour later, I, I, I went back down, and there he was. And I'd re- hustled him up to our little tiny cupboard of a studio and sat him down. And I'd written some questions, and 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 you know, let him answer in his own voice and so mm-hmm. on. But I always remember something he said, and this was so Adam West and it was so beautiful because his command of the language was good. He was a very erudite man. And um, he said, I said, what, what do you think a world would be like without Superman? Um, how would you personally feel, Mr. West? And he thought for a minute, he said, I'd feel shattered, torpedoed, riven. And it was just like, <laughs> Wow, this is, this is, you can't make up stuff like this. Bless him. So anyway, he he did that, um, and I, it kind of made me. And and we we mix this all together and, and dramatize these little comic book sequences. And although I'd wanted to write for a long time, and I'd sort of written the obligatory, really dreadful novel when I was about eighteen, nineteen, and then I, you know, sort of written odd silly films we'd done at, at, at uh, school and then at uh, college. You know, I'd never really got it under my under my kind of hood, what I was trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but this 
suddenly hearing this come to life and hearing actors play this stuff and with an actor like Bill Hootkins, William Hootkins was playing Alex Luthor and he's the he's the big guy. He was Porkins in Star Wars, the original oh, right. movie. Okay, yeah. And he was in um, the Indiana Jones first Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. He's the one who says they've got top man, top man <laughs> on it, Mr. <laughs> Dr. Jones. And um, and Bill was great because he was no he was a proper Hollywood actor transplanted to London because he'd married an English girl. And so he was, I, I kind of got the feeling that I would get on with someone like this. And when we were halfway through doing a sequence and I wasn't allowed to direct this, someone else was doing it, uh, who was a lovely guy, but he kept asking for retakes without asking, telling them why he wanted retakes, telling the cast. And Bill, um, after about the fourth retake, Bill just threw his script on the floor of the studio and says, now listen, we're actors. We're American actors. Tell us what to do, and we'll do it. But if we don't know, we'll be here to fucking doomsday. <laughs> and um, and at, the, at which point, I kind of I was behind this, you know, this lovely guy who was doing it, but you know, who was not making it clear what he wanted. And I just sort of did the, the whirling windmill thing with my finger, which means speed it up. Mm -hmm. And that got the take. Thank goodness. So I thought, mm, you know, I, I think I can do this. I can, I'm learning on the job here mm -hmm. that put these things together. But, you know, it was always, it was all baby steps. And I was incredibly lucky to be a, a producer in radio comedy. But it was also, I was became very keenly aware of my shortcomings. It wasn't, you know, you get thrown in at the deep end and you're going to swallow a few mouthfuls of water before you finally keep your head above the surface. Mm -hmm. And this was very much my the process I went through. And, and the very first comedy show that was nothing to do with me I was given was called The Long Hot Satsuma. And it was with Barry Cryer, Graham Garden, Paul B. Davis. They were the writers on it. Mm -hmm. uh, with um, Alison Steadman and Julia Hills uh, as sort of, uh, as the female element of the cast. And it was a sketch show. And it was really interesting to work with these really established writers because you know Barry's been around since Doomsday mm -hmm. and Graham as well for that matter and, you know and Graham used to write with John Cleese and Graham Chapman and you know he's part of that school mm -hmm. and Paul is an incredibly Paul Bassett Davis as he goes by now very talented writer and novelist and here I am a neophyte producer all I've ever done is a 30 second ruddy trailer and I've got to kind of tell these established writers what's wrong with their sketches and I was talking with Paul the other day we've just make, made contact again and he said we used to bring in everything and then go to the pub assuming that you'd haul us over the coals in the afternoon because of what we'd given you and you never did you were just happy to get it and I said well that's that's how little I knew but I kind of, there, it was a very steep learning curve because you've kind of got to be in charge when you produce people like that. Mm -hmm. Not to, you don't need to throw your weight around, but you've got to have a certain focused clarity of mission. And if you don't know what the mission is because you're that inexperienced, it's quite hard to do. Yeah. And, but I, I realized the day Graham came in, it was about th third episode of the series, and they were pretty much writing them as we went or finding the scripts as we went. And Graham had me this script. And it was very funny, sort of Blue Peter one, where they're talking about how to make your own submachine gun or something like that. <laughs> you know, and, or, 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 or you must be careful because these parts are very sharp, things <laughs> like that. Um, but there were lots of visual effects descriptions in there, and I suddenly realised that um, uh, that Graham actually was giving me a script that was a, was a, was a hand me down from a TV thing that hadn't worked out. Mm -hmm. You know, the scales fell off my eyes. Oh, I get it. So these guys are actually so actually these guys are just like me. You know, occasionally inspiration fails them, and they just have to go to the bottom drawer. <laughs> and suddenly I thought, Ah, you're going to get it now. Um, so that was kind of that was a learning. This I'm 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 sort of giving you my writer's journey, but in no, a way like it's this, quite yeah. good to do it this okay. way because it's better. Yeah, yeah, it's from, good. It helps me to talk about things in terms of the scripts because the scripts are exactly where all the good stuff lies. Mm -hmm. And so I was learning on the job, and then they gave me the news headlines, which was the one show I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do End of the Pier, Carry On gags i thought it was old-fashioned sexist racist everything i just mm -hmm. i i didn't want to do it and although i thought joe um, roy was a lovely man i just didn't i didn't know the show that well the bits i'd heard i wasn't sure about and so on anyway what you're going to get weekending all the news headlines we've decided to give you the news headlines 
because you come from Radio 2 and you understand it. And I thought, well, I'm not going to say anything because I might again get neither. But the difference between the two shows was that Hudlines had um, 300 people in the audience every week. Weekending was done without an audience. Mm-hmm. And so you had to be funny. You had to have laughs per page. It was a real comedy writing. Um, it, it was about the comedy. Yeah. I went in. I learned everything I know about writing. I learned on the news Hudlines. Okay. Everything. I really learned and that has stuck. And this was the funny part. The one experience I didn't think would teach me anything, taught me everything. Yeah. And in the process, um, afterwards, uh, you know, Roy said, you know, I brought something to them. So it was good for me from that point of view because I realised they did have something to offer because I'm always the first person to think, oh, you know, I think a bit, a bit out of my depth here. Yeah. Um, but we did about, uh, oh, I don't know, probably about four or five weeks worth of shows and I thought it was going great because the audience were falling about every week and you know every gag landed and it was great and so on and so forth and I had the experience where I was now in the writers room and I had all these writers and we had all what they used to have was a sort of collective about between sort of four and eight commission writers who were commissioned to write three minutes a day each so if you've got eight of them eight threes that's 21 minutes covered Mm-hmm. hopefully it's all usable which leaves you about six to seven minutes for the non-commissioned writers and that's where you bring on the new talent and this was one of the joys of the job was actually bringing on new talent and um uh, and and now it um it's uh i'm trying to think what the name of the program on radio 4 extra is now does this news jack um but they they now do that but for a long time the bbc didn't and i always felt it was one of our core jobs for the bbc was to bring on new mm-hmm. talent Anyway, it was a real experience going into my first writer's room for these people because they had seen it all. But the worst thing that happened was that all the established writers had just left with the previous producer, Mark Robson. So I didn't have Andy Hamilton, Nick Revel, Malcolm Williamson, Stuart Silver, or Stuart stayed for a couple of things. Stuart, by the way, who is not the Stuart Silver in movies, but Stuart is one of the finest funniest comedy writers we have and not many people have heard of him because he generally works in the shadows but he has been writing most of lee evans's material for the last 30 right. years all oh, right well, you know he's he's, yeah. he's up there you just don't know about him yeah he's also guilty of writing the single funniest idea for a film i ever saw which was called hail hitler about hitler's weatherman <laughs> and it had the just <laughs> Stuart's Jewish, you know, so he's going to write Hitler comedies. That kind of goes with the territory. Yeah, Hail Hitler. The best gag in it was when they're going to shoot the weatherman, he fails to re- he fails to predict the fog, which stops them being able to take aim at it. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I shouldn't give the gag away. But anyway. <laughs> it was a short film, but very funny. Anyway. But um, so all these old sweats had gone and I had to recruit the next, I had to bump up the next generation of people who were kind of commissioned, but not quite, which was hair raising and then bring on new people, which was fascinating because I was learning all the time what worked in the show, what writers I had available. It was a real balancing act. Anyway, about four, six weeks into, it was about six weeks into doing the first series. And uh, and the audience were falling about. I thought, great, we're working. This is good. Everybody's happy. I think I've got this. And Roy came up to me after a show. He said, and, and Roy, because he had bad eyesight, used to come up to you about an inch from your face to talk to you so he could see you. I said, it's not working, is it, Dirk? I said, what? It's not working, is it? <clears throat> it's uh, it's comic cuts, isn't it, Dirk? And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, Roy. Isn't it funny? He said, oh, yeah, it's funny. It's got no point. It's got no point. You, you're going for the jokes, but there's no context to the jokes. There's no structure, no context. So the jokes just go bang, 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 but we're not making any point. And I thought, oh, my God. And it sort of scales threw off my eyes, and I realised there was no structure in it. It mm-hmm. was just a list of guys. Went away, came back with the best script we've ever written, uh, got everybody on it, walking down Low Regent Street to the Paris studio that Thursday morning, and all the writers were out on the 
pavement having a fag and, and you didn't have to go outside to have a fag in those days you could have a fag anywhere mm. and I thought this is weird what is there a fire drill or something I went down and said what's wrong and Oleg Sp- Stepaniuk one of, one of the right says no no have you not heard I said no what he said Thatcher's just resigned and it's like you know it's like Johnson resigns today mm. you know you've, mm-hmm. you've done a whole show which is full of Thatcher gags and they're yeah. all out the window <laughs> so basically you know, unpin the script, drop half of it in a BBC bin with a resounding clang, and then rewrite the show that morning for a lunchtime recording. And we did it. But the thing was, because it was about... I I think what I had assembled was quite good because I, you know, I cannibalised parts that could be cannibalised later Mm -hmm. on in the run. But that we had a reason for the show. And because we had a reason, we had a structure. Because we had a structure, every gag could be set up and paid off and mean something. And from then on, we really were sort of cruising. And I, it just, the scales fell from my eyes. And it was that sort of experience on a weekly basis of go, taking in a script I thought was good. And then Roy would go to like my favorite sketch and say, yeah, no, that one looks better written down. Rip, that goes in the bin. And you think, mm. ah, yeah, okay, okay. It's good written down, but it's not going to perform well. Yeah. And so this was the, 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 the experience I got. So going back now to my other sort of string, which was doing this sort of superhero stuff, I did a Superman docudrama and I did a Batman docudrama, which I uh, co-wrote with a guy, a really good writer called Simon Bullivant, who went on to develop They Think It's All Over. And, um, and, and I, I was beginning to get a sense of structure and of pacing and of paying stuff off. If it wasn't a gag, you'd still pay off a plot point. All the things that as writers you can get out of the books by Sid Field or um, Robert uh, Thingamajig. But, you know, actually, if you physically have to do them every week, if you're lucky enough to get paid to do them, you really bloody learn them, especially yeah, yeah. if there's people in the room. And, sp- and with actors, of course. So then Radio 4 wanted something else and I suggested all sorts of things and they said, no, how about some Superman? Adventures of Superman. So now I was really into the business of taking the comic books and translating them into into sort of action in an audio sense. And this is where I was trying to use all the resources of the studio to basically create a cinema soundtrack with all the sound effects and the music and the locations and the feeling of the voices being in that location. This is where I was learning the sort of the, te- the technical side of audio to make it sound like a movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we were still working with analog equipment on quarter inch tape and it became clear that was not really good enough for what we wanted to do. And there was a sort of turning point where Douglas Adams rang my boss to ask if I might be interested in doing, um, bringing the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy back from the novels he'd written later on to radio where it all started. Mm -hmm. And would uh, Dirk be interested in doing it because he'd heard Superman and he liked the way I made things and Jeffrey Perkins was no longer in radio, he was now in television. And so I'm thinking, holy smoke, and I'm, I'm around at Douglas's before he's hung up, you know, the mm-hmm. phone, saying, yes, please. And, um, and that didn't happen because it was, there were copyright issues and various things. Then the, there was a script which was written by someone else, very good writer, award-winning writer, who decided to rewrite it in his own style and give Simon Jones as Arthur Dent a talking dinosaur in prehistoric <laughs> times and uh, literally I heard the explosion in Islington from broadcasting <laughs> house as Douglas read this and Douglas on the phone go, did, but, did you read this as an exploding dinosaur uh, there's a talking dinosaur in it. What on earth and I said, yes I know it's Douglas that's why I send it straight to you because I had a feeling that wasn't going to wash not wash <laughs> come round at once come round at once so I went around to Douglas's and Jane, his wife, answered the door and she just said, he's downstairs. I thought, oh, God, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> Went down to the basement office and he's banging away on this, this you know, Mac uh, laptop, banging away. And he looks up, he says, I can't write this all a second time. I can't write this all a second, second time. And uh, he said, look, and, and, he, and he showed me what he was doing. And basically he was transcribing the book into sort of script form. Mm-hmm. He said, that's all, that's all he needed. What did he have to had a bucking dinosaur for. I said, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I, you, you, you were the guy who agreed to have him. Anyway, he was a bit cross, put it that way. Um, anyway, he slammed it shut. He said, I can't, I can't write this. 
I can't write this all again. And I said, well, look, I could do it. I could do it and then you can vet it. And if you don't like what I've done, you, or, or you can either edit what I've done or, or get someone else. But I'm producing it anyway. As long as I get a bit of money for doing it, I don't mind. You don't have to pay me as much as they'd have to pay you and you can still put your name on it. Yeah, 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 it's a good idea, good idea. Anyway, long story short, then the BBC dropped the ball on the contract and the whole thing ground to a halt. But in the, in the, in, in the, the two things came off that. First of all, I started making contacts with the studio outside the BBC where they did Dolby Surround and stuff like that. And they worked in digits, which was really useful because then mm -hmm. I began to see how to put noises together in a cinematic way without going through generations of tape where the tape hiss builds up and all the old analog problems yeah. that nobody has nowadays, which when you moan about it, you youngsters, you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, but the, the other thing that happened was that there was a sort of a gap in the schedule and um, and and two things happened. First of all, I, I got a secondment to Loose Ends with Ned Sherring, which was just joy fun, joyful fun on a Saturday because Ned was the you know, extremely intelligent ex-barrister who then went on to do satire on TV. That was the week that was. He discovered David Frost. He was the inventor of modern TV satire along with Peter Cook sort of thing. So that was fascinating for my own personal development in terms of writing. It was a good experience, even though at the time I thought it was a disaster that this had all, all fallen apart. But the other thing that happened was that Radio 5 had started and they were running drama at that time and they needed a drama. And so I just said, well, would you do a Superman? And so we did another Superman. And this time I based it on the comic books um, that were coming out as we were doing it. So that was quite good because I was getting it before it was drawn, these scripts, mm -hmm. and I was able to see, and it was very much like a film script, as you probably yeah. know. A comic book script is kind of like a film script. So I'm coming to a point here, a writing point, by the way, <laughs> just to reassure you. So that had all gone quite well, and come 1994, and I was, I was, I'd finished on Hardlines. We'd finished our runs of Marx Brothers' recreations flywheel shiter and flywheel which mark brisenden adapted from the old 1930s scripts which were just the best fun in the studio i've had pretty much ever um and uh i was at a bit of a loose end and radio one matthew banister had just taken over and he was throwing out all the old smashy and nicey kind of yeah. djs um that uh, harry enfield and paul whitehouse would portray Mm -hmm. uh, all right, mate. Yo, oh, yo, guys. Yo, come on, then. Let's, uh, let's get down with Shawadi Wadi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was get throwing all that out. <laughs> I can't think why. And um, he was um, he wanted a daily drama, and he wanted something with a bit of pizzazz. And so he wanted, and and he he got us producers all at Radio Light Entent together. So I'm in this room with all these other people and there's Armando Iannucci and there's Lissa Evans who went on to produce Father Ted and now is a novelist and there's Jon Magnusson who went on to you know, do Graham, um, uh, huh, Graham Norton's TV show and all of the, you know, I mean, there's room for the talent. Yeah. And there's me at the back thinking, I don't belong here, right? <laughs> I'm nobody. <clears throat> anyway, went around the room and I thought, well, what they're going to want, it's Radio 1, it's the BBC, what are they going to want? They're going to want... A story about, you know, sort of um, um, amputee, drug-addicted, um, single mothers in a tenement in <laughs> Belfast during the Troubles or something. I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to use cliches here, <laughs> but the BBC's idea of socially conscious drama was pretty cliched at that time. It's, you know, on a relentless dive into gloom. And I'm not very good at gloom. Well, I'm, <laughs> you have to ask my kids. But anyway, <laughs> but, um, so uh, they went around the room and, and all these ideas came up and I thought, mm, like that. And eventually I was the last one. I literally was hiding in the back. I said, what about you, Dirk? What have you got? And I sort of, and I, it just literally came into my head. I had no idea what I was saying. I just said, Batman. And he said, done. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> great. And I thought, Oh shit! Oh, can I get the rights? I mean, what? what? Which Batman? And so on and so forth. But I thought, no, this is good. This is good. And then, he, and then he said, "This was the killer." He said, "And I need it in three-minute daily episodes." And I went, "Okay." And then I walked out the room and went back to the office where Maureen, my PA, was. And I said, "Mo, what have I done? What have I done?" Um. Anyway, so. I thought, okay, okay. 
had a quick look at what was happening in Batman. I thought maybe something that's happening in the moment in the comics and blow me down. They literally just started this Nightfall story about and Batman breaks his back and this other character um, who's Azrael mm-hmm. takes over and it all goes very you know, dodgy. And in the end, Batman comes back. But it was a good story. And it was quite a long story arc. And I, I, established, I, I pretty quickly established with Matthew it would run about 65 daily episodes, which was, you know, so what's that, 11 weeks? No, more than that. 12 weeks. Uh, come on, Dirk. Anyway, never mind. Moving on. Yeah. Moving hastily <laughs> on. Um, <clears throat> and um, rang DC. What do you think, guys? Oh, well, that, um, there's a movie coming out with Val Kilmer. We'll have to check. Or whatever, you know, something like that. Shit, shit, shit. And then they rang back and said, um, no, you're okay. You're six months after the last release. You're six months before the next release. It'll fit in. Um, Nightfall, fine. You want us to send us the stuff? Great. And so I had um, a guy called Charlie Cotman, who's still a friend, um, was working at DC at the time. And he would get literally take the scripts from Scott Peterson's desk and kind of um, photocopy them and FedEx them over with whatever artwork. Um, and Phyllis was kind of like letting me know that things were right. But Denny O'Neill, um, who was the the dear departed recently, um, was, was also across what I was doing and would occasionally send notes and so on. A bit like Mike Carlin had for the, the Supermans we had done. And, um, and they were lovely. I mean, DC were just lovely and totally supportive and I'd send over drafts and they, you know, come back and the notes would be pretty minimal because I'd learned a lot on, you know, some mm-hmm. of the previous things. But what was interesting from a writing point of view about doing these three-minute episodes was for the first time I actually really had to think about making compressing structure to fit a very limited time frame. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what particularly worried me was that um, Alan Plater, the playwright at that time, was the um, president of the Writers Guild that I was a member of. And he said, somebody said to him, it was like in the paper... Radio 1 pro, 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 um, proposes three-minute daily drama. And he said, it can't be done. You can't do drama in three minutes. And I thought, great. Only the head of my own bloody union <laughs> thinks it's impossible. <laughs> so I had to do it. And I was looking at the comic book, and, you know, y- 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 son, when you think about structure and the comic book, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, it's changing now because the, the new sort of comic book style is to have a kind of, you know, just a, a, a kind of non-stop feed of images from, yeah. from sort of uh, yeah. right to left going past your eyes. But, of course, in the traditional comic book, you've got your, first of all, opening pages from right to left, but then you are actually processing information in a sort of downward path down mm-hmm. each page, usually left, right, left, right, so on. So it's kind of interesting because I realized that three minutes a day drama basically equated to, I'm not talking directly, but I mean in, in, in terms of the sense of the thing, of how a comic book page works. Because, at the, I mean, let's, first of all, you, you, you get the comic. There's the, there's the front page, which is to, drew, is to capture your attention. You get the inside splash page, which is another big, usually a big panel to mm-hmm. capture attention. Then you get into the meat of the story. Then you get usually into individual panels, sometimes jiggled up, but let's say sake of argument. And the first one is probably picking up from the previous uh, episode and is, if you like, kind of catching up as you move the story forward. So mm-hmm. any exposition from part backstory you do while you're moving forward to the next thing. That was my first thing. Never, ever, ever do catch-up exposition without having some a clock ticking somewhere in the background. Um, even if the, the um, there's one episode which starts in the Batcave where they're talking about what to do next. And in order to keep the clock ticking, I had the Bat computer in the background saying, current list of escapees from Arkham Asylum, the Riddler, the Joker, mm-hmm. Amygdala. Uh, you know all of this so you would you're always keeping a layer of sense and this is where the layers thing came in that I I was learning on the on the digital because in digits you can manipulate sound much more cleanly so it was first of all hit the ground running tell the backstory as you're moving towards your your big incident for this episode for this page 
Mm -hmm. then something happens on the page. There will be some kind of incident. There's some kind of beat, story beat for the overall story, which, you know, will happen you know, kind of, uh, I've forgotten how long they ran, maybe about six, six pages. I don't know. It's about 30 seconds per page. So around about the bottom of page two to the bottom of page three would be where the incident happens. Then you have recovery from the incident. And then you have the final, which the cliffhanger, which I say cliffhanger, but I, I don't mean to be super over-dramatized cheesy. It can just be, what's that? You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a yeah. big deal, but it's, you've got to, what, you've, the thing about the comic books, and this was the other thing, bottom of the page, of the second page of a left-right spread is the panel that makes you want to turn the page over. Mm -hmm. And that was the key to doing a three-minute episode. You start on the hoof. You've, you, you're dealing with your backstory while you're, you're moving forward with your forestory. You simplify stuff, politics, um, protocols, bureaucracy, that really you don't need to explain why Mayor Kroll has decided to vacate his office because there's a problem with finance. You just say he's vacated his office. Mm -hmm. If you can get that point in later, fine. But don't waste time explaining stuff which isn't utterly germane to story. And it became a beautiful system of refinement. And so by the time we ended up with 65 three-minute episodes, more or less, not only did it have... You know, my, my worry then, if I can step back a moment, my worry then was there would be a sort of sine wave you know, in terms of plot, mm. because every three minutes there'd be this sort of blip of, of what the, <laughs> going on. Um, but actually, because the main story ran through all of that, you could kind of, on a long list, and disguise that with all the other warp and weft of the tapestry going through it all. So in the end, it turned out to be a lot less of an issue than I thought, and it turned out to be quite a good listen. Well, in fact, it turned out to be a very good listen because people still enjoy listening to it now because basically it doesn't hang around. It just mm -hmm. bangs along. No, I, I remember cool? listening to it, in fact. I've, I've still got the cassette tapes downstairs of Nightfall. In fact, um, it was, yeah, and it was great as a... I did hear it on the radio occasionally, but the way I listened to it was in that sort of double pack of cassettes as a big long thing and it was it was great i really really enjoyed that it was it was good for me because it taught me that i wasn't wrong about my instincts but 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 it also taught me where i was wrong and had to had to turn stuff around and i do remember there was one occasion we were in the doing a big showdown scene and there was peter marenko who's playing bane and uh, kerry who's joker i mean they were all in that day doing various parts because Kerry also played Azrael. That's right. Mm. And, um, and there was a scene that just wasn't working. And in the end, we just laid out all the sheets of paper for the, for, for that scene on the, on the floor of the studio and talked our way through it and rewrote it as a collect, as a sort of workshop group to make mm -hmm. it work because the comic, the way the comic did, it was sort of like a, Oh, and that happened, but we had to show that happening. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was, but but that was Batman was the one, Nightfall, where I really thought, oh, that yeah, that's a principle I can always apply to writing. And so after that, um, I always went in with a plan that nothing ever. My my idea of a nightmare scene, a real pig of a scene to do in sound, is two blokes in a pub talking. Mm -hmm. That's my mm -hmm. idea of hell, because two blokes in a pub talking is a utterly boring for me in terms of content in terms of background in terms of getting anything done the only time it sometimes would work for me is if they're what they're talking about is such enormous import and had so many amazing plot turning points and beats in that it was worth doing um and because the one thing i realized really was that scene belongs more in television than it does in radio because in radio you can do anything mm -hmm. you can literally do anything so yes well, I mean, I, I, I kind of wondered about about the way in, when you adapted a, a script uh, from a comic book into a radio drama, how much control did you have? Did, were you able to make those choices, you know, creatively to say, actually, we're going to totally change this? Or would you have to run that past the writers or DC? Or could you just say, no, this is the way it's working best for radio. So this is the way we've got that we're going to do it. The, the deal with DC was also always to, that they had um, script uh, approval. And 
I learned very quickly what they didn't approve. Mm -hmm. And what they didn't approve was stuff that the characters just didn't do, capital letter on the start yeah. of each word. For example, Clark Kent, I'm making this one up, but Clark Kent wouldn't say, I really need a cigarette and go into a, into a, a phone booth to change on the pretext of ha having a cigarette in the phone booth because Superman doesn't approve of cigarettes. That sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I wandered off, if I had to... Uh, you, that's such a good question, Tariq, because one of the things I learned about comic books as opposed to um, the medium the cinematic sounding audio I wanted to do was that actually in those days, this has changed a bit in the years since, but they used an awful lot of words. Mm -hmm. They used mm -hmm. a lot more words than you'd think. And if you, I tried an experiment earlier on when we were doing it of literally just taking the words as, as they were written by the writer for the artist to put in speech balloons. And with all the descriptive captions and the speech balloons, it became way over-described. It was astonishing for such a visual medium. So I started cutting stuff down, and that, that was very early on in the process. And they let me do that. They didn't mind if I kind of shrank it mm -hmm. or compressed it, um, but they did mind if I changed anything um, and it, it crossed over with the character, which is fair enough. You know, you, you wouldn't do that. Um, so, you know, if Batman gave Alfred a lingering farewell kiss as he jumped into Batman, <laughs> that could be an issue. <laughs> um, although who knows where, where it will go now, folks. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they were pretty good. But I've always had this thing about if you're going to adapt something, it's already, it, I think this goes back to Douglas saying, I'm not going to write this all over again. I can't write mm -hmm. this all over again. Uh, but he was absolutely determined that what he wrote in the book should be in the in the mm -hmm. dramatization. And I couldn't see a good reason why it shouldn't be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the end, when we did um, uh, the tertiary phase, which was Life, the Universe, and everything which was the, the first of the three books and the one that we were particularly having problems with that he then started writing himself the scripts for, he was... Uh, when we finally did that, it was really a faithful dramatization of the book. I mean, it was pretty much word for word. I didn't change a lot. And as a result, when we did it, I thought it sounded slightly turgid, slightly stodgy. Mm -hmm. And that's why for the fourth and fifth books, which were not books we discussed so much, I took two decisions. The first was to, while well, sticking to the story, zip the, zip the dialogue up a bit. Douglas was one for the prolix sentence, which had mm -hmm. an awful lot of subordinate clauses in, which is fine for the voice of the book, but it's not good for, say, for Beeble Brox when he's about to be pushed off the bridge of his ship by a cricket <laughs> robot. You know, there are, there are moments when you don't spend a lot of time saying something, like, help. Um, on the other hand, there are occasions when one would shorten what Douglas had a character say in order to keep the rhythm of the language flowing for the cast. Yeah. On the other hand, there were there was a major problem between the second series of Hitchhikers on the radio, which happened in 1979-80, and the version which picked up from it, which was it ended on um, the Golga, Golga Frencham spaceship or whatever it was, um, it, it ended in one location and it started on prehistoric earth because in between he'd written the books and changed the location. And this is when I said to him, um, don't you think the fans will have a problem with that? He said, oh, fuck the fans. And that was when I <laughs> two valuable lessons there. But it always stuck with me that, you know, the second series ends somewhere and the third series starts somewhere and I wanted us to be canonical. So it, it bugged me. And him not being around because he tragically died in between us, you know, not making it and then finally making it, mm -hmm. meant that I could think about how to plot it so that they actually could join together because there was a temporal anomaly which allowed that to happen. And as it happens, there were so many things that Douglas strewn along the path that Douglas had written. It was actually not hard to make the Babelfish a sort of MacGuffin, if you mm -hmm. like, in the Hitchcock mm -hmm. sense, and which would then allow us to give them a get out of jail free card, which is effectively what we did. Um, and also, 
all the time that the fourth book is happening, the the Vogons must be plotting to destroy the Earth because basically it's not it's it's not a done deal for the Vogons. And so uh, the other thing I did in the fourth series was introduce the idea that the Vogons were having a court of inquiry as to why the Earth was still there and indeed sorting out, uh, you know, ways of, of destroying Earth, which then set up the, the, the plot um, in the final um, series of the planet called Rupert and the aliens there who eventually destroy Earth. Now, I, as I say this to you, I, I begin to run out of energy <laughs> because it's so complicated. <laughs> but the point was I had to honour, yeah. I had to honour what Douglas had written, but at the same time, my sense of structure was 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 irritated by the fact that this was you know he's he's writing stuff under pressure and he's you know he's he's kind of he's locked in the hotel room by Sonny Meta to do it um you know I'm I've got to square the circle here so that was one of the times when I actually decided to gainsay Douglas gainsay an author the other thing I did on Hitchhikers which wasn't something Douglas had anticipated was I actually added an ending. I added an ending because the original ending, which um, was Douglas, I think, had just had enough, was that he killed off everybody. Yeah, he it's a very unsatisfying off. ending, I always thought, to the last book. Well, you know, um, this was where I got in a lot of hot water with, um, with the fans because okay. if Douglas had written it, so it should be. But mm. the fact was when I met Douglas, I think one of the reasons he wanted to bring it back to audio, back to radio, was to um, A, hear it again with the original cast, but B, give it a new lease of life so he could think what else to do. I think mm. he was really burned out by the time he'd finished that book. Yeah. And he regretted killing off Arthur and Trillian and Ford and so on and so forth. So, um, really, it was a question of how do we how do we turn this ending around? And this was part of the thing where I wasn't going to change what he'd written, but I could I could add to it. And the idea that everything stops at the moment that the narrative stops as they all die means that. There's a breakdown. We'd established that you kind of are being told the story by the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the voice of the book, if you like. Mm -hmm. You're being told by the voice of the book the story. So the voice of the book, if it conks out because Earth has been destroyed, if there's a few bzz, bzz noises and then it comes back, and the first thing you hear is Peter Jones, the late Peter Jones, reading about get, giving us the, the thing about uh, Babelfish is one of the most peculiar creatures in the universe. Um, and then that blends into Bill Franklin, who takes us off that original script and into the fact that the other thing about the Babelfish is that if you have one in your ear at the moment of any great calamity, it will instantaneously transport itself and you <laughs> to any other cause of uh, any other arc of probability in which it can survive, which was a sort of real old MacGuffin, but on yeah. the other hand, was exactly what we needed. Um, and it, and, to get and it us fits out of that trouble. world perfectly, I think, as well. That's the kind of thing you would get in those stories. And I, th I felt it had just the right Douglasy yeah, exactly. level of desperation, to plucking a plot point out of thin <laughs> yeah. air in order to turn things around. What do I need now? I need a shoe horizon. An yeah, ultimate I've brought myself into an absolute corner. You know, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just brilliant. It's brilliant. How can this? How can we power this spaceship? Let's make it powered by a, a, an Italian bistro, a bistro <laughs> mathics. Oh, that's good. Yes, how you how you calculate your your bill at the end of a meal in a group of people. <laughs> it was that sort of level of grabbing something. Yeah. But it worked really, really well. And what it meant was we could say that there were any number of possible endings, and then we could pull in people like Ruler. Um, Lenska, who was you know playing Lintilla as being in one scenario where Arthur ends up with a sort of harem of Lintillas who will wait on him hand and foot, and then, and then you know various other things where he's lying outside the, his his house uh, in front of the bulldozer, but this time he's got with him the girl he loves, Fenchurch, and then the final one, which is where they're all at the restaurant at the end of the universe, and they're out in the moonlit pools where dolphins leap, and they lay in the limpid waters looking up at an ocean of stars you know and it's real kind of not a dry eye in the house stuff but actually um 
I just thought, I don't know. I know Douglas, if he was here, would probably whack me with a cricket bat for this. But on the other hand, it's we've been through these adventures with Arthur for so long. And the poor sod, every time has had everything drop on his head. Why shouldn't he end up with a break? Let's mm -hmm. give the guy a break. And so we did it. And it's very interesting because the reaction from the diehard fans at first was hostility that, you know, we dared gainsay Douglas. But the point was, as I tried to explain, if you want to end where everybody dies, just don't play the last track on the CD yeah. or don't listen after 24 yeah. minutes, 30 on exactly. the day. But, um, yeah, but uh, over the years, people... I get lots of emails still from people. There are th two things I get emails about a lot. A Batman Nightfall from Ancient History mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that last episode of Hitchhikers where people are grateful. And they say, when I'm really miserable and things are really rotten, I play that last part because it cheers me to think that, you know, there might be some, some better alternative than what I've had happen yeah. to me. Yeah. So that's when you sort of think there's an enormous power to storytelling, which is, which is actually the healing power of saying look even in amongst all this crap there's some positive yeah outcome yeah so and yeah it's especially when it's an audio thing as well i think it can really d transport you even more in a way than a book sometimes if it's done well it, you know you close your eyes and suddenly you're you're where you were when you first heard it or whatever it, it brings it all back much more vividly i think mm -hmm. I get really boring on the subject of <laughs> how great audio is, but, then, <laughs> but I would, wouldn't I? You know, so that's yeah. And, and you've obviously been done lots of lots of other stuff, and most recently Sandman, um, the Sandman adaptation for Audible, um, which is fantastic. Mm. How how did that come about? Because Sandman, of course, is a story that is famously. Certainly, it's been called unfilmable, albeit they're now going to be doing that. Um, I, and and it wouldn't have been something that people would have thought could be adapted for an audio experience yeah. either. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm curious to see what they do with Sandman for the TV series. It has to definitely a TV series is what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work backwards on this one because I mm -hmm. usually answer this question four to after i'm going to go after four okay <laughs> the tv series is an interesting proposition and i think they've they're going to do some interesting things and neil is involved which is excellent news for everybody mm -hmm. yeah because it means that it has got neil's eye on it um i think it will be interesting um and i was concerned because I really want there to be clear blue water between what we are doing with Sandman and what the TV series is doing with Sandman. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment, because we had actually got the deal, but it was taking forever to sort things out, lawyers being lawyers, where I knew that a TV one would happen sooner or later, but I was praying it wouldn't happen while we were still in, you know, making this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it was announced before we were announced. And that was a blow because I just thought, damn, damn, damn. Not because I don't want there to be a TV version, but because I didn't want our sleek ocean-going yacht to be swamped in the bow wave of this monster Titanic vessel yeah. that is a TV production. Yeah. Um, I'd rather always be in the yacht, by the way, in case that analogy mm -hmm. did sufficiently. <laughs> Um, put that across but that said I know it's in good hands and Neil is involved and it will be excellent but the one thing the one comfort I took from it all was because it the, the one comfort uh, my wife's been at the gin again the, <laughs> the one comfort I took from it all was that I knew the television version would change stuff because that's what TV versions do tv and picture versions of things change stuff they do it for the very good reason that people want to be surprised mm -hmm. people want to be visually stimulated and there are an awful lot of people working on a tv pr production you've got heads of department including art department wardrobe set design props bada bing bada bada bada. there's it's it's it takes a village to make a tv show 
it takes a household to make an audio thing, mm. it kind of. Yeah. Although I'd say fa- fairly large house <laughs> in the case of Sandman. Um, so what could we do on Sandman, which the TV series wouldn't do? And the thing we could do that the TV series wouldn't do, I was pretty sure, was do it exactly like the books. Yeah. Even more than usual, even more, sticking even more to it than I would normally do. Mm-hmm. I'd all, I was about halfway through adapting the first episode where the news came out and I just scrapped it and I, I uh, emailed Neil. I said, I'm going to go at this again. I am going now to cleave very close to your original work. I am not going to add anything. I'm not going to transpose scenes. I'm not going to try and do background scenes. I am just going to write what's in the um, comic books. And because of that, I'm going to need your original scripts. Because I'm, I need to absolutely stick very closely to what you, what you wanted, and he sent me the original scripts. Well, all bar the first three, which were, you know, have disappeared into di- digital bits somewhere in hyperspace. Um, and as soon as I got them, I realised we could put something unique into what we were doing that the TV series couldn't, and that was Neil Gaiman himself. Neil had already said to me. He'd really like to be the narrator if I thought he was good enough, mm-hmm. which is you know, typical Neil. <laughs> so I said, no, we're getting Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> no, but, you know, but it's, uh, yes, of course you're good enough. Don't be daft. You're the, you're the genius who wrote it. But the thing was, as soon as I got the script from Neil, I'm reading all his instructions to the writers and the, uh, to the artists and the inkers and the letterer Todd Klein. And when you're reading Neil talking to Mike Dringenberg or Sam Keith or whoever's mm. doing the art, and you and his introductory, he you would write an introductory page before he even got to the script, and after the script there are notes, and in the script there are notes. This is the mother load of Neil Gaiman actually being in the room writing this stuff. You are in his head as he's bent over his quill pen and candle in his puff sleeve shirt <laughs> in some, you know, Keats. <laughs> ode to a nightingale um you know that's in, in neil's ro- the romantic images of neil um uh he would getting inside neil's head was actually so easy because the way he wrote the descriptions in itself was almost poetic it mm-hmm. was kind of like i mean one particular episode in this first series um, number 16, Lost Hearts, really reads like Dylan Thomas's Under Milk Wood. Um, which you, and if you know that piece, either as a written piece or as a radio piece, because it was done by Richard Burton in the 50s, and if you haven't heard it, find it because it's magic. Because Burton is reading in this very Burton Welsh voice. Um, and Neil's voice is so clear in these descriptions and there is a rhythm and a poetry and he's just, and this is for one, maybe two people, this audience mm-hmm. is reading this and it's just brilliant. And no one's read it. I mean, I mean, one yeah. or two he put at the end of the comments. And here I've got this stuff. And it just becomes totally clear to me that what we can give people is the ultimate companion to the existing work, which is you're inside the author's head as he's writing it and the characters are coming to life around him and the ambiences they are in and the worlds they're in. And then if you add an absolute drop-dead gorgeous music track by a really brilliant composer like Jim Hannigan, Mm -hmm. you end up with this sort of euphoric miasma you know this sort of hallucinatory mixture you know you're you're in this atmosphere of magic that it creates and it changes from story to story but there with a with a sort of the through line that it's always neil telling you it's neil who hands you by the hand and takes you through this Mm -hmm. and i knew then that we didn't have to worry about the tv series that we would do our thing I suddenly relaxed and I suddenly thought we'll be all right. The only question was, would the fans accept it? You know, James as De- uh, Morpheus, Cat, Dennings as Death, all of these, you know, all the things where casting becomes so tricky. And then you think, well, all we've got, all we can do is go with what we think will work. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then we came up with the best cast we could and blow me down. There've been very few people who haven't 
like the casting to the point of asking if they can't be the TV cast as well, which is not <laughs> what I don't mind what they can do, what the hell they want. But the thing is, that means we, we got it right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the cast is the end, fantastic. Sorry, I was, going, I, was going, I was going to sort of finish on the note of saying that really the whole point of this has been from start to finish, from the very start of the Superman stuff that I used to do through all that stuff till we get to Neil was to stick with what the writer originally put. If you're going to adapt something, then, you know, you don't if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And yeah. that was really the big lesson on this. It's it's at that on that point. I know you sort of touched on it with the TV stuff as well, but it's funny. I always find it odd that in films and stuff like that, or where you've got comic characters that have got a history, they've got seventy five years of stories to pick from, and yet they try and come up with their own, frankly, mediocre stories a lot of the time. Um, I, I, it's just something I'm, you know, as someone that has loved comics growing up and read them and stuff, I just don't understand. You've got a whole gold mine of stuff there. Why not yeah. stick more closely Absolutely. to that? It, yeah. it doesn't make a lot of sense to me at all. I, and I think say. that is something that I think a person I've seen Marvel do better in the film side of things when they've kind of taken Civil War or whatever and they've and, and they've taken stuff that they know worked on the comic and they've tweaked it to to, to work on, on, on film, but it's They've taken the basis of that story that they know works, and they've not tried to reinvent it from scratch. If you know, they've it's even if it's a hodgepodge of different stuff, it's all based on, on the writing mm-hmm. of the comic book stuff. And and yeah, as you say, if it, you know, if it isn't broke, why why go to the bother of having to reinvent something? I think um, I think the big lesson I learned was Peter Jackson doing Lord of the Rings, which I yeah. you know yeah. I love the books, and there was the Ralph Bakshi animated film in the late seventies, which was mm. just awful sorry ralph but <laughs> but peter jackson and and um fran boy boy i've forgotten the name anyway but his other half did exactly the right thing with it they trusted the material trust yeah. the material yes mm-hmm. you need to edit down occasionally you need to lose tom bombadil or whatever it is but you you stick to the right to if the, it became a legend because it was written well why change it yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. so yeah i couldn't agree more and you know neil obviously was very happy about it i mean it's been i think it has been a massive success is it not it certainly seems to be yeah it was, so it was number one in a whole bunch of charts and stuff you know even the book chart i don't know if the book charts include audible version does that yes they, they do yeah so we are a new york times number one bestseller fantastic um, and yeah. and the actual and and audible are part of the amazon group and very secretive about figures but mm-hmm. i know it's done astonishingly well um i can't i can't capitalize those letters enough those words <laughs> enough to say how well it's done which is great because frankly it's it's put it this way it's the first non-fiction thing to sell in the amounts it has sold um wow uh, nice which is amazing and is still doing so which is great and the thing is you know what that's not what's important to me. It's doing the good job that's important to me. But what I've really wanted to do, because I've been around for a while now, is to create um, a, an atmosphere in which doing really, really well-produced, high-concept pieces of audio, which use a sort of visual grammar in the script writing and in, the, and in their production, that could be something that people will choose to listen to, r- go out and look for, rather than accidentally chance upon. And yeah. even after all the years of Hitchhikers and the Batmans and the Supermans and, and so on, it's actually been quite a long time um, of trying very hard to break through. And it really, you know, we've done more recently for Audible, I've done an X-Files title with David Duchovny and Julian mm-hmm. Anderson. They get it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And we've done alien titles, yeah. you know, which is really a challenge technically because one of your key characters actually doesn't <laughs> speak, speak a lot, it just <laughs> yeah. eats people. Um, uh, you know, uh, so this is the first time, and I'd said to my wife, you know, because I could, you know, go and bum around playing drums if, if, well, if we didn't have COVID, I guess. 
um, you know, sort of like, oh, sod it, you know. This is, the work's very exhausting, you know. These, mm-hmm. This uh, audio post-production on these, really your brain is running out of your ears at the end of the day. And it's entirely my fault for making it so detailed. And I said to her, look, this is going to do one of two things, and they're both good. Either we finally get the elephant up to the top of the mountain, and everybody can see this elephant that we've got to the top of the mountain, or it doesn't get to the top of the mountain, in which case we walk away from the elephant and we go and have fun. If it gets to the top of the mountain, we get more work and we've proved that audio, sort of visual audio is possible. Mm -hmm. And if not, it isn't. And then Neil Gaiman, the wretch, said, um, oh, um, of course, what he said the other day to me, he said, uh, well, um, yeah, but, you know, actually, really, all you need to do, you, you proved that all you needed to do to get the elephant to the top of the mountain was to leave a bunch of bananas at the top of the mountain. <laughs> and a whole herd of elephants came. And I said, Neil, the whole point those bloody elephants got to the mountain because I was flipping, pushing them. You were standing with the bananas. <laughs> so we had this, we had an energetic discussion about elephants' bananas. But, but the fact is, there are, there are a herd of elephants at the top of the mountain and people are now looking for this stuff and the annoying part is that a lot of the old batman and superman stuff which still stands up is now out of ruddy print isn't it you know mm-hmm. the, the copies aren't available so but but hopefully they will let us do more sandmans and there are plans to do some other stuff which is really cool um and i'm now getting a team together of people so that i can supervise rather than this was my own work of my own hands yeah. literally yeah. sandman this time to to do the proof of concept to to if you like make the template the if you will masterpiece in the terms of the guilds where to prove your <laughs> your your quality you built mm-hmm. a masterpiece of work that then yeah. others your apprentices yeah. then emulated well this is how this has been so i'm hoping that'll be the case D- nice. do you think it'll lead to you know it's, it's a great cast that the sandman has um do you think it'll lead or potentially lead to more big name actors um doing audible not audible audio dramas sorry um generally i think actually we've we've kind of the the big name actors in this country will always join a cast because luckily we have the bbc and Mm -hmm. so when we were doing when i was working with heather lama who's uh who was bbc radio northern ireland dramas and she got finally sold neil game into bbc radio 4 she finally sold them neverwhere mm-hmm. and um i went in for the table read and i walk into the table read and sitting at the table next to me is natalie dormer then there's james mcavoy then there's sophie Ocanido, then there's benedict cumberbatch then there's bernard cribbins then there's andrew Sachs, then there's david harewood and then there's sir christopher lee and i'm thinking holy smoke and so when we broke for coffee and neil um, and um neil wasn't there neil couldn't make it he's so fed up he missed it Uh, (laughs) and um james came up and said you know he's this character in in episode three is a bit of a moaning mini isn't he can we can we change it and i said yeah why not you know i was i was for him yeah (laughs) and i said james tell me why I know this is a really stupid question because I'm just, you're doing such a fantastic job, but why are you here? Why are you doing this when you could be earning telephone numbers in Hollywood, for fuck's sake? He said, why am I here? Because I love this shit. (laughs) And and that was it. And it was because, you know, the the talent in the room is there because of the talent in the writing and on on the production side. And... And that was the thing. And attracting names to do Sandman, you know, to come and do Sandman with Neil Gaiman. I mean, in some cases, it actually turned out to be tricky, but that was more because we were trying to cast the net wide. So for death, you know, there was no, I think the only nation on earth in ethnicity and culture who wasn't on the list for death was Inuit. I think we had (laughs) every other variety of human being available. Um, I mean, it just so happened it went to Cat, but it could have gone to, you know, an, yeah. uh, an African actress or whatever. I mean, it just it just needed to be the right voice. And mm-hmm. in the end, yeah. a punky goth girl 
and cat and that whole fresh sparky thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know who it is when she opens her mouth. Yeah. That turned out to be cat. But um, no, um, if I, I, this is all prefaced with if, because obviously we haven't been formally commissioned yet, but if we do further series of Sandman, I don't anticipate the level of names in the casting to go down. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. anything, I hope they'll, let's say they'll stay the same or better, which is. And if you, if you were someone starting out or wanting to get into uh, writing sort of radio drama type stuff, what, what, it, I mean, obviously you got into it in a very unique way at a, at a different time. What do you think the path is now? How, how would someone go about that, do you think? Well, the, the thing is that things have really improved for people who want to try, in some ways, have really improved for people who want to try this stuff out. Because 15 years ago or so, when we were doing The Hitchhikers, things were winding down. The internet hadn't really, podcasting, which mm. is now a thing, hadn't really taken off. And so, really, um, if you were talking about getting into scripted audio, you were talking about joining the BBC in, well, London or Scotland or Belfast, really, is, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and then there are limited slots available, Um uh, which is always a you know a tricky one, but the last fifteen years everything's changed because America has rediscovered scripted audio. They've rediscovered audio drama or radio mm -hmm. drama, if you like. But I I don't do drama. I do what I call in really clunky terms audio movies because I can't think how to explain how we use the cinematic mm -hmm. uh, lexicon vocabulary to to make audio a visual thing but it's not the same as radio drama it's not rattling teacups and more tea vicar although it can be the thing about being a writer now and you're interested in this medium is actually this works for any medium because this works for the visual media this works for stage and it certainly works for the ear and and here's the thing you you want to you want to write scripted stuff Okay, I'm talking, I mean, you can do a single voice reading of, of your own prose work anytime and your own poetry. I mean, that's a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. But if, let's say you want to do scripted work and you want to learn about structure and pacing and timing and how, if you put it in the mouth of another human being, how it comes out. The beauty of this medium is now that we all carry it with us. We have iPhones or we have smartphones, we have pads, we have laptops, we, microphones are, you know, a, a reasonably good microphone is less mm -hmm. than a hundred pounds. Um, you can get sound effects and music from the web. I mean, you have to respect copyright, but at the same time for your own personal use, you can use anything you like, as long as you don't try and sell it or put it up publicly, you're good. And I mean, always pay the person who made the work. That's important because there are mm. a lot of people who don't do that. We're having a lot of trouble at the moment with Sandman going out in pirated form and it's like mm. whack-a-mole, you know, to try and stop this stuff because mm -hmm. um, basically people don't earn a living if it gets given away. It's, yeah. it's work for sale. Um, but here's the thing. You want to write a half-hour situation comedy, let's say. Well... And you, you think, but I'll, I'll never get into the BBC to make this or I'll never do this. But, but the fact is now you can make it. You don't have to wait to go anywhere. Why don't you try making it? Record it. Yeah. And if you need, and you think, well, I haven't got a studio with a dead acoustic. You've got an acoustic like I've got in this room at the moment where it's, you know, which is mm -hmm. terrible. But that's because this isn't a studio. If I wanted to record myself talking to you absolutely dead, do you know where I'd go now? I'd sit in the back seat of my car, do it there. Car is a brilliant dead acoustic. If you if you're not mm -hmm. too near the reflective front window, which pushes yeah. sound back at you, makes it sound boxy. You know, it's not that hard. Or gaffer duvets to the walls. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's not hard to create a reasonably soundproof environment. And let's say you want to do your play, which or you think you're writing the movie, or your radio audio drama. Well. There's nothing better than trying to do it yourself. The best way to learn anything is to actually have something in mind and then put it together yourself. And, oh, but I can't, I have no recourse to professional actors. Well, have you got a local amateur dramatic group near you? Got any mates who used to be really good in a school play? Well, 
cast your thing according to the people that you think might do it well, who you know well. Get them round with a pop with a promise of beer and pizza as a reward, and record it. You know, in an area you've yeah. prepared. And uh, yeah, I know COVID is is gets in the way of that at the moment, but COVID won't be with us forever. You know, in a year no. or two, we'll, we'll be back to normal, as it were, mm. um, if anything is normal in this crazy world. But you know, you can. The power to create in this medium is more in people's hands than it ever has been. It's absolutely astonishing. But it's not just the power to create. You have the power to then um, disseminate it because you can actually put it out on the on the air. You can put it out on the mm-hmm. website. You could put it up on YouTube. Watch for copyrights, but you can. If you want to have music for it, you could always get a mate who's a musician. Mm-hmm. If they're good, there's... You can tell, if you are a storyteller who wants to write stuff that will be performed, there is no reason why you can't actually get it performed and direct it yourself and then find out what the actual practicalities of both writing it and uh, realizing it are. So um, it's it's a brilliant time to be a writer. And then making a living at it, that's harder. I haven't always managed to make that happen, mm. as my wife will readily attest. <laughs> but, but the fact is, at the same time, you know, if you keep, if you have a dream and you keep at it and you can keep improving what you do and improving your technique, you will make something of that. You will get a rewarding result. And this sounds terribly airy fairy and pie in the sky, but it really, really is true. I, all I can tell you is I'm now able to pay my bills, which, you know, <laughs> so it must mean something. And it, I'm, put it this way: I'm I'm not at the moment having to bolster my income by drumming. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. does pay, the world pay the a bills, favor. Doing what what you love, and that's the most important yes. thing, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's Absolutely. it. Um, and so you you sort of hinted that you're working on other stuff. Are you able to to see any of the projects that you're currently working on or are going to be working on in the future? No, probably not. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> we had to try. We had to try. No, but but there there um there's one thing in particular. I mean, what I've I, I have written my own stuff. I did a I did a thing called the Apes from Space about you know space monkeys sent to space in the early sixties who come back super intelligent, um, which was fun and um, I really enjoyed and was fond of. And I'd love to have written more original stuff myself. But there's so much already good stuff out there at the moment. And I made a conscious decision to kind of do big tentpole stuff like Sandman. Um, Hitchhikers was, you know, Douglas chose me. So uh, that was how that worked mm-hmm. out. But but generally speaking, I'm now going for stuff I know will... will. I mean, I'm not doing Star Wars, but but it could be that level if you know what i mean yeah or yeah, yeah. that Absolutely. sort of thing because i think it's my job to to be the icebreaker to cut through the pack ice so that the the, the pleasure ve- vessels can come through later the the, the 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 new original stories in this if i can establish a story selling style that's really visual and dynamic and tell big tentpole stories in that story style then i think my job is done and and I've had a lot of fun meeting some really nice people. So I did, for example, last year, I did the great unmade William Gibson Alien 3 screenplay. Mm-hmm. And we had yep. Lance Henriksen and Michael Bean reprising Bishop and Hicks yep. uh, for Audible. Yep. And so, you know, you can attract good talent. You can have a lot of fun. You can play in, in other boxes of Lego, other people's boxes of Lego. You know, I could be Jim Cameron for a yep. couple of weeks, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm very happy to be doing that because... Because there's enough good stuff out there already as it is. So the things I have in mind are kind of other people's stuff, but they kind of select other people's stuff. They're not the obvious ones, hopefully. Nice. Okay. Oh, very That's excited great. to see what, what, what comes from that, for sure. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> what was the last book that you read? Uh, it was um, uh, Please Don't Ask for Mercy as Refusal Often Offends by Paul Bassett Davis. Very funny. It's actually not as funny as Paul can be because it's, it's quite an interesting dystopian novel set in a future, oh. which is not entirely 
as you would think it is starting the book. It's a kind of a who done it come conspiracy theory thing and it looks like to be the first of several and I, I enjoyed it. I, I feel I have to reread it now to get some of the subtleties. So I can recommend Excellent. it. Yes, it's nice. uh, Please Don't Ask for Mercy as Refusal Often Offends by Paul Bassett <laughs> Davis, published by God knows who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what was the last film you watched? Uh, uh, I can tell you that. It was Empire of the Sun we watched oh, last night. Oh, the old right. Spielberg, yeah, Spielberg one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very young uh, Christian Bale, is it? Yes, yeah. a very yeah. young Christian Bale. And an interesting, and John Malkovich and Miranda Richardson. And it's a film at the time which I kind of went over my head slightly. I, I kind of... I haven't watched it since it came out, so last night was very interesting to watch it and to see how subtle it is and mm-hmm. how full of themes how the how it's it's about sort of corrupted childhood um mm-hmm. and it's about friendship and it's about social structures in times of great pressure and it's a, a very interesting film i enjoyed it thoroughly yeah i've, I've not seen it for years actually yeah yeah i need mm-hmm. to revisit that as well um what was the last tv show you watched or are watching I'll tell you something, the one that stuck with me, which I thought was very, very well written, was This Morning, which is the is on Apple TV. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, but the news Jennifer can, Aniston the news and room. Steve yeah. Carell. And the writing and the acting on that, absolutely. Mark, um, I've forgotten his other name, he's such a good actor, this guy. He's really, really good. And um, and he's, he's, he's kind of one of these leading support actors and there's him and there's um uh there's uh oh billy crudup oh yeah it's so Great. damn good i mean yeah. you know i love watching good actors yeah mm-hmm. i've heard it, i've heard very good things about it yeah it's it is excellent but you've got to have an apple tv although i think yeah. if you you get a week's grace you can if you can squeeze it into seven days you can, I can watch binge it, it and yeah. then quickly get out <laughs> <Yeah>. the subscription <laughs> Um, yeah. And the, the 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 very last thing we always do is a very quick either or. So um, there's no right or wrong answers for most of them. So uh, the first one, Superman or Batman? Superman. He's harder <laughs> no to do. Okay. Much yes. harder to yes. do well. Yeah. And if, uh, yeah, it's funny. We've had we've had this chat before about how the Superman films are. They kind of miss the point almost of the comics, which is kind of oh, a boy don't scout. start me. We'll be here for another CCS. bloody hour. <laughs> they totally, yeah. and that's the funny thing. Those those cynical old people, those producers of of the of the movies with Chris Reeve, mm-hmm. yeah, lucked into getting Richard Donner to direct that yeah. first one. Mm-hmm. And between Donner and Reeve, they nailed yeah, that yeah, character. Totally. And yeah. no one has done it since. No. no one's done it since. Not in that way. They didn't get it right. It wasn't perfect. There were some terrible missteps. The, the, the Superman story that hasn't been told is, is Lex Luthor, is Donald Trump, is, <laughs> yes. becomes president of the USA, yeah. mm-hmm. and Superman can't lay a glove on him despite mm-hmm. everything he's doing because it goes against what Superman yeah. stands for. Mm-hmm. He can't rub this guy out, but he's got to stop him. And he can't. his powers are useless. Yeah. yeah. That's a really interesting premise. That is, yeah, yeah, I like that. And that's that's, a, that's a, an original story. I'd and that's write. much more interesting way to, to neuter him rather than just turning him human or something. That's a more interesting yeah. way to stop him being yeah. so powerful. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um. A uh, real book or an e-book? Uh, well, I'd always rather hold a, a real book, but as someone who's got this room that I'm sitting in is normally lined with bookcases and I'm just dying in here of books. <laughs> so I have to say at these days, sadly, e-books, unless it's some beautiful book of art in which you get. My wife bought me a beautiful, sand, as a present for finishing Sandman, she bought me a big book of the original, of facsimiles of the original comic book art, oh, comic wow. book boards. Nice. And that is a book that you have to have as a real book. Yeah, absolutely. Just to follow that one up, uh, where does an audio book sit against a... Uh, well... Uh, obviously superior to both excellent (laughs) the pictures are better oh don't don't do that Uh, and uh, the last one uh, TV or cinema cinema has to be really cinema because of the scale of it and the fact that you're in the dark and you can just if you get the right movie 
and there very seldom is the right movie. There are a handful of movies that really do it. Mm-hmm. But if you're in a cinema in 1933 and you see the original King Kong and the imagination that comes up with that, because if you say someone that idea, they're going to go, get out. Mm-hmm. And then you watch that film and you put yourself mentally in the position of someone who's going through the depression and you're sitting there watching a bunch of adventurers on an island and there is a giant ape fighting dinosaurs on this island. It is amazing. And it comes yeah. to New York. Yeah. King Kong is the start of it all. And and you can't create that experience in a te- off a television screen. Yeah. Watch it now and it looks manky and it looks bitty. Go in a dark room, project it on a screen where from corner to corner it's 50 feet and watch King Kong and see the art in that movie. Everything flows from that. All the great movies flow from that. For me, I know this is sacrilege. I should say Citizen Kane <laughs> and all that. But for me, it's King. I mean, you wouldn't have your... your your Star Wars or your Spiel or Jaws right. or any of this stuff. King Kong started all of that. And on the other foot, then, you know, obviously, I, I love the, I love films like um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I, in, the, in the 70s, before Star Wars, BSW, there was an era of watching movies in cinema. You really know what you expect. And you'd go in and you'd see a movie like Cuckoo's Nest and you'd go in there and you'd come out a changed person, yeah. a changed mm-hmm. human being. Mm-hmm. That you don't get so much these days. Everybody's trying to go for the big box office blockbuster dollar, and yeah. uh, and, and we've lost something. So, I don't yeah. Know. yeah, where am I yeah. going with it? Excellent. The cinema, anyway. <laughs> cinema. Stop it, Terry. <laughs> Stop asking. <laughs> You know, there's always a reason why I thought I liked Dirk. <laughs> and his incredible enthusiasm for ebooks might just be the reason why. Well, I think it was more a sort of default position to ebooks. An incredible than... answer from an incredible. And of course, answer. audiobooks were his, were his most preferred <laughs> yeah. way of, way of uh, consuming it. But I'm not sure if I'll go that far, but uh, <laughs> I'll take that as a win. So then that's, is that three? I think you might have three people now that have liked <laughs> ebooks, Derek. Um, but oh, yeah, that, I thought that was a really fun and interesting chat with Dirk there. Um, yeah, really good just amazing that, that you know we said it at the start but how he's plowed his own furrow here really and created what is now a massive thing you know these audio oh, sure. these audio events on audible are huge and uh, you know other people doing these things have him to thank you know there was the i think there was a was there a podcast with wolverine or something that's right yeah, um, yeah. and that was very much of the mode oh. of of the superman batman type stuff that Dirk did previously yeah. you know it, it's it's all thanks to him coming up with this and being determined to do this that, that yeah. other people have been able to do it i mean we're seeing it even in the, the podcast world with non big story stuff you're mm-hmm. seeing like welcome to night vale that kind of like little creepy horror stuff mm-hmm. you know investigation podcasts are becoming less dry and they are becoming more personable there's more yeah you know music sound effects more production and, values and, and, and as Dirk was saying from, if like, you want to get into that if you want to write stuff and create stuff the beauty is that you can i mean yeah, look at yeah. us we're a couple of idiots we've got microphones and <laughs> we put this on the internet um uh, but you know you can you could create a, a an audio drama yourself or an audio movie if you if you pull everything together it's not impossible you don't have no. to start out at the bbc like he did in the, it, no, and, and, and it's, it's the beauty of it is that the budget is a laptop and a microphone you know you don't mm-hmm. need a lot of money to have a sound effect of a helicopter you no can, you can do that kind of thing on the cheap and you know if you're wanting to tell you know stories that sometimes might be too ambitious if you were a screenwriter you know it's difficult to make movies because they cost a lot of money but you can create the most exciting effectively big budget type story and record it all with your friends and yeah. a mic and some music creative use of music and sound effects and it could be amazing and it can get out there to everyone so i i think it's a really exciting field to think about if you're if you're into writing and Absolutely. i really really look forward to what dirt comes out with next which is yep. bound to include Sandman season two as well. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm very much excited. Anyone who's not listened to Sandman or the Alien books or the X Files books, go and check him out. He's got a massive catalogue, especially in Audible, I think. But mm-hmm. whatever you could find them, they're excellent and definitely have listened to them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So thanks very much, Dirk, for taking all that time to speak to us. We really, really appreciate that. 
Next week, we've got another great guest, Owen Nichols, who is a screenwriter and an author. So he was a screenwriter who um, sort of turned his hand to writing books, and he wrote uh, Love Unscripted was his book, which is a sort of... uh, I guess it's kind of like a rom com, but not your most conventional rom com. Um, it's you know, it's it's a bit more grounded, a bit more realistic, I think, uh, in yeah. terms of the characters and stuff. Kind of quasi based in his life, a little bit. Uh, well, well, sort of. Yeah, it definitely takes inspiration from parts of parts of his life, but but he was very clear to say it wasn't about him as well. <laughs> um, but it's it's again a really interesting story that he's got about you know the screenwriting side of it and moving into uh, writing prose. So I highly recommend tuning in for that one. And of course, if anybody wants to get in touch, they can always send us an email to to podcast at rightgear.co.uk or send us a tweet to at right underscore gear. Yeah, and if you enjoyed this episode or previous episodes, please do take the time to give us a rating on whatever podcast app you use. Certainly Apple Podcasts is good because it helps us climb the charts. We were climbing quite high in the charts last week. Um, Yeah smashed past the guardian and we did the guardian books podcast was was below us at, at one point which was yeah, great far below us, I believe. <laughs> well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below and if you want to get in touch you can always drop us a tweet in the twitter machine which is at uk page one as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.